welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. I'm your host, Deborah Chantry-Taylor. I'm passionate about helping entrepreneurs and their leadership teams get what they want out of business and life. On the show, I invite successful business owners and expert speakers to share their successes. They are open and honest about the highs and lows of business and also life as a business owner. We want to share those learnings with you to inspire you, but also to help you avoid some of the common mistakes. My hope is that you take something from each of these short episodes that you can put into action to help you get what you want, not only out of your business, but also your life. So good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today I am joined by Alex Morris, who is a digital marketer, a digital marketing consultant, a business owner and also a loving father. Welcome, Alex. Hello, Deb. Like, yeah. Nice to see you. Lovely to see you too. Now you've got a business called, called the, To The Moon Digital. Just want to yes. give us a little bit of an overview of what that does. Yeah, yeah. We are a uh, digital marketing agency. We do done-for-you marketing and marketing consulting for coaches and consultants, anyone who really is in that space where they want appointments with people. So we're in that um, sort of that online coaching space where you've got your health coaches and your your business coaches, but we also are moving quite organically into a lot of more professional services, a bit more white collar stuff. Yeah. And uh, also we're, we're starting out some programs for the beginners as well, people who need to get into marketing their own online business in that coaching or service space, but really they, they, they don't really know where to start. So we're, um, we're trying to be across all, you know, levels of that demographic. Fantastic. So we're going to talk a little bit today about what you need to do as a professional services business owner and how you can actually maximize that. Before we get started, I always like to ask for a professional and a personal best from my guests, just so that we can see the, you know, the man behind the voice. Sure. Um, professional, you know, I've, I've been in the, I was in the coaching space myself for about six or seven years before going into full-time marketing. And I learned to do the marketing through that coaching thing. Um, about a, about two years ago, I found out that we were having not one, but two babies. And so I thought, okay, I can't do the cooking demos because I was in nutrition. I can't do the cooking demos. I can't visit gyms. I can't be doing the webinars and all the late night team calls and everything. How can I work on my computer full-time? Yep. So that's what got me into the digital marketing full-time space. And honestly, I, th- I think personal, the professional best, I, I have some big numbers to flash around, like, you know, the clients who have gone and banked a million dollars off of one campaign, but they're not the people who I resonate with the most because they're people who just work all day, every day and love it. I am much more of a lifestyle guy. I'm a family guy. And so for me, um, I really love when I get to hang out with people like one of my clients who literally struggled to pay me a $500 deposit. And then during that pandemic, he ended up managing to support his family, his growing family of four through his seminar business that he ran completely online with the help of our marketing. So that was really, really cool to see, you know, the transformation of a young dad who was really in the weeds and then managed to actually pull it together for his family. His partner lost her job. And with our help and as a team, we we um we put food on the table for him. So that was great. That's awesome. Yeah. Hey, look, I mean, you and I are on the same page. I think that uh, much as I love business, I genuinely love what I do. It's not about working every hour that God said. It's about having a life outside of that as well. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it depends what you're into, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you've got to figure that out. And for me, there were some times pre-family where I thought, okay, I can work all day, every day. And I could. I used to be in hospitality. It's very long hours. And that was kind of like, you know, my, my badge of honor. I was a really hard worker. Yep. But um, priorities change. And I'm really supportive of however people want to do it. If, they're, if they want to grind and hustle, good for them. If they're more into um, wearing shorts and going to the beach, then uh, they're a bit more like me. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So, um, you know, I want to talk about what this means for professional services, consultants, that kind of people. What I mean, the whole digital marketing space has changed a lot. Mm. Um, can you give us a little bit of an, an insight into what's changed and why it's important? Well, it, you know, it's it's um, it's become a digital world, which is goes without saying. But I think 
the first thing we do when we look for a company these days is really check out their socials more so than a website. I think a, a lot of people have become the face of their own business. It's pretty rare in this coaching space for someone to call themselves to the moon digital. You know, it's people just brand themselves as themselves and for consultants and professional coaches, business coaches, leadership, everyone is their own brand. And so because there's so many options and so much competition out there, I feel like you really need to be using digital marketing, both paid and organic and creating that digital brand for yourself where people can instantly find out what they need to about you and trust you. And that doesn't mean you have to be posting, you know, your life on Instagram and being an influencer, that sort of thing, vlogging every moment of the day. But if people can find your service, find your consulting business or whatever you are and see a face behind the business, see a brand behind the face and see that you're a trustworthy guy or gal, then um, it's it's becoming an increasingly important thing. And it's definitely overtaken any face-to-face businesses, any handshakes, especially the last two years, you know, have, having that digital landscape behind you is uh, more important than ever. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, you're absolutely right. It, people people do business with people. And mm. so you can have the flash company website that talks about what you do, but in actual fact, they want to know who it is they're actually working with and what that person is like. And they are going to look you up and sort of see, hey, what is this person? Um, you know, do they have any presence? Who are they? What are they doing? So, yeah, it's very important. Yeah. Not not just for your um not just for your main person, but I think also people within the business as well. So I work with a lot of professional services businesses, and you know, sure, you've got the founder who is the kind of the the main guy or girl in the in the lead of the of the business. But at the same time, they've got a whole team behind them, and people like knowing who it is they're actually dealing with. Yeah, and you see that with um, you know the the rise of YouTube podcasts in rather than polished television. You know, it's the same as media. People are really into that unpolished version of people where we can see a little window into someone's life as much as they choose to show us they can see the mistakes you messed up the intro of this podcast yes. and I think <laughs> I would, if if that was was me I would absolutely be posting the, the stuff up because that's kind of on my brand I'm yeah. definitely not perfect and so um the the business space has become a lot more authentic I think and people can sniff out a a BS artist these days. And um, you can use marketing to do both. You can use your marketing to pretend or to show who you really are. And I think people are slowly moving towards wanting to work with the people who are just themselves. It's really interesting. I, um, I've been brought up British. And so we had, there's a real, uh, two parts to me one of them is that you know we just swear naturally in Britain you know look at the forward sort of funeral the opening scene has got fuck 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 and that's how it sort of starts off and yep. so that's how we're brought up in the English society but I have parents who are actually really really strict and wouldn't allow me to swear and so for many many years even though if you meet me in person I, I swear like a trooper I never actually swore on social media because I thought but I can't it's not the right thing to do and I remember the first time I actually said fucking do it on a social media post and it's probably one of the most commented on posts that I've ever had because it was actually just me being me for a change um and 100 yeah I, I was holding back a little bit uh <laughs> I, i'm english as well i grew up in i grew up in nottingham and then i went to university in nottingham <laughs> there you go i left when i was 11 so you know it doesn't really count but um yeah 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 then i was a chef for 12 years and so that's definitely a, a sweary environment then you come into business and you think okay i've got to act differently and i see myself doing it i see myself Hoppy into a video or a podcast and putting on a different T-shirt and thinking, why did I just do that? Yeah. You know, that is bizarre. I mean, I was wearing a, a singlet this morning, so I, there's a little level of respect there for you <laughs> and your sure. audience. But, um, but you know, I, I mean, have to be yourself. And in the marketing space, no matter how much you just want to share your wins in that white collar or whatever environment you're in, I think that's going to be one of my biggest messages for 2022 is people to... um really stop trying to polish everything they do look, look as um give yourself as much authority as possible whilst being who you truly are on the internet 
So what about, so I remember, I mean, I've been very, very fortunate. I have done a lot of TV work and done a lot of um, videoing before. So I got over, uh, you know, being worried about being on video, being on camera or or even just talking into a podcast. But for some people, it's really scary, right? It's it's up there with public speaking. Like imagine putting myself a video out of myself or imagine putting out anything that isn't polished. What would you say to them in terms of how could they start? How do they get over that? I have a really favorite quote that I love. I have no idea who said it. <laughs> it is, uh, you'll stop caring what people think about you when you realize how seldom they do. And this is super important on social media because there's two kinds of people. There's people who will sit and pour over every word in their, you know, every Instagram post and edit everything perfectly and then they'll sit and freak out before every Facebook Live they do, and then they'll post it, and then they'll get three people watch it. And then the same thing on my end, I think we post about 22 pieces of content a day across every platform, and, you know, we don't get that much engagement on some of them. On some of them, we get nothing, Uh, but it's disappeared. People see it, and it's gone. And so I think... We're in a beautiful space with public speaking and presenting online is that you can practice all you want and you're never really going to dampen your public image too much if you fuck up because most people aren't watching at the beginning. And then the better you get, the more people are watching, the less they care about your stuff up because they're there for a reason. So I think it's uh, actually we've got a window with our phones to be a presenter, a professional presenter, and all we've got to do is start and just realize that, you know, your ego and your fear is is going to have no effect on this. No, no one's watching in the beginning, and that is a beautiful thing to remember. Yeah. I'm well aware that, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely not an influencer yet or anything, uh, but I've been doing, you know, presenting for seven or eight years now, and it's uh, you'll get better the more you do it, but at the beginning... Don't worry about it because people are scrolling and they're scrolling quickly. <laughs> and I think also I, one of the things I found more so on LinkedIn because that's where most of my sort of activity is being in the business yep. world. But you know, people, you get zero engagement, no comments, no likes. You think, oh, what was the point? And then mm. all of a sudden, you'll suddenly get somebody come back to you and they'll say, oh, I've been following you for ages. <laughs> it's like, what? How come yeah. you never commented? How come you ever said anything? I actually had a client who literally I hadn't heard from. I bought an old Porsche from him seven years ago and I'd heard nothing from him. He was connected on LinkedIn. He never commented, never, you know, never liked nothing. And all of a sudden I get this email out of the blue. Look, I've been following you. I see you're now an EOS implementer. Um, I'd love to have a chat to you about putting EOS into my business. And I was like, hold on a second, seven years have passed, haven't heard a thing from you. And yet there you are in the background, obviously, you know, seeing something. So it's it's not a, yeah. it's not a short-term game. And it's also, you know, people are watching even if they're not commenting. That's a very good point. I probably sound a little bit cynical on my end, but um, I, I'm doing it from a, the most optimistic space as to don't worry about it because other people aren't. But absolutely, yeah. you're right. You will have fans without even knowing. And, um, you know, while some people give out their likes and their comments very generously, other people um, uh, do not. They will watch and consume and, you know, just because they're not tapping you a heart react doesn't mean that they don't think you're fantastic and you're not inspiring people. So, yeah. you know, you never, you never know who's watching as well as the absolute other side to what I just said. Yeah, cool. Okay, so, so when you work with, with clients, you know, how do you get started? How do you actually start working with them what do you do what's the process it'll sound cliche deb but we go through you know who's your target market you know what are their problems their pains their desires yep and then we dig in really far into that so i send people our sort of foundations document and i always say to clients i've got this after you know after month one i've got this covered but the first month is a lot of work from you because i don't know your business i need to learn how to write copy like a 27 year old woman you know or like a um a 54 year old financial advisor and as a uh, as a 30 year old ex-chef now digital marketer and vegetable addict i need to um i, I don't know how to do those things without knowing your market really well so the the first thing is to to figure that out and we some people know that straight away and some people need a lot of help with that and what I often say to a coach or a consultant is 
who do you help and what do you help them with? Yeah. And if they can't answer that question in one sentence, then there's work to be done because you need that offer. You need that brand. You, you know, often on a LinkedIn profile, you'll see below someone's profile picture, leadership coach, and then I help X to achieve Y. Yep. And everyone needs to have that. And if they don't know that, then we'll work on that straight away. How do we make your offer really concise? How do we make your um, branding concise? Even, even if you do have a broad spectrum of things you can do and people you can help, we've got to start on one of them because mm-hmm. when you're marketing um, and your, your message has to be, you know, an inch wide and a mile deep, not a mile wide and an inch deep, you know? So we, we kind of have to decide with someone, if you're a business coach, you're a leadership coach and, oh, I work with every business. It's like, okay, that's awesome. And I'm sure you can help them, but which market are you having the best success with? Who do you find you, um, you like to work with the most? And let's focus on them. What do they want? What do, so I had a business coach who I'm working with now and he does, he helps all sorts of people, but he loves working with the construction industry and tradies and, and builders. So we, we dove deep on builders. What do builders want? What are they struggling with right now? There's labor shortages. There's lumber shortages. There's um, all sorts of shit going on in the building world. So what's going to be a resource and an offer that will grab their attention. And that's where we always start. What does the market want? And let's just hone in on one thing before we then expand over the coming months. Perfect. I I think it's it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think it was Jim Collins who said that if you get really, really strong on your sweet spot or the he uses the whole hedgehog concept thing, then you'll actually never die of starvation because there is plenty of business out there. But unfortunately, as humans, we tend to go, well, I I can do everything. But just because you can Mm. do everything doesn't mean that that is your um, your sweet spot, your ideal client. So we do a similar thing in EOS. We say to people, hey, look, you know, we know that you can help all these things. But what is the real, you know, the ideal client that you want to work with? Yeah, it's that shiny object syndrome, isn't it, that we all have as entrepreneurs. It's all, uh, oh, what if I went and helped restaurants? So what if we, you wouldn't help them? Terrible business model at the moment. But, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, maybe I could do this. Maybe I could do that. And you got to put those blinkers on. And in marketing, it's very, very similar because uh, whether you're, you don't want to diversify your budget too much, your time too much, your audience, your message, you really want to hone in on one thing. And some of the most successful people out there, you've never heard of because they're not in your demographic. That's I'm, right. interview- I'm interviewing a guy later on called the bucket list guy. Oh, and yeah. I've never heard of him, but he's got a huge following with people and I'm just not in his demographic. Yeah. And, uh, and so I'm super interested. And we find that a lot in the coaching space, people who do it really well, there's that you only need a thousand true fans vibe. And, um, you know, you can get there by having a pretty focused message demographic and offer and then you can dive deep and once you've you know made that predictable and scalable you know try something else out never leave something on the table and I also think, I mean, I, I know when we talk about this with our EOS clients, we talk about the marketing strategy and we define that, you know, that really um, sweet spot for the clients. It means that you're targeting them. It doesn't mean you have to say no to somebody who doesn't meet that exact thing, but it means you have the choice. And it means that you are focusing your energy and your efforts towards that rather than trying to, you know, reach, like you said, a huge wide audience and wasting time, budget, money, effort. Yeah. Okay, so we've, we've got the, the ideal client, we've got the target persona, we've dove quite deep on what their pains and things are. Um mm-hmm. What else? What, what happens next? We work um, pretty pretty primarily on social media. Uh, so Facebook and Instagram, but we're moving more into LinkedIn as well this year as we get more professional services clients. Yep. But the first thing we always do is we come up with, you know, a, a sort of a lead magnet for people. Lead magnet being your classic bait for your audience. Yeah. And I, I always find myself coming back to that fishing analogy that just clients are fish, but they're, you know, they kind of are, they put food on the table, you, you bring them in and they, um, and they become an asset to you and your business and your family. So we come up with some sort of lead magnet. So let's use the building example, mm-hmm. the builder. We need to grab attention for people from the internet who have no idea who we are. And what we need to do when we're picking this kind of campaign we're going to go for is really think about risk. And the risk is not for us as the business owner, putting the money out to pay for the ads. It's for the prospect 
clicking on the ad? How much risk are they taking by opting into your resource or your lead magnet? And you see all the time, you know, sort of beginners and, you know, people up in that more advanced section as well saying, book a 60 minute strategy session with me. Mm-hmm. And for someone who doesn't, you know, if, if Tony Robbins said book a, a free session with me, he'd get a lot of them, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but for someone, you know, you don't, you don't know to, to risk spending 60 minutes of your precious time. We're all so busy on the phone with someone you don't know the possibility of human conflict and interaction and potentially being pushed, you know, invited to buy something yep. that is very, very risky for someone. Mm-hmm. We start at the top end of that, which is what's a, a non-committal resource that we can give to the world. That's going to let us know this person's, you know, in our wheelhouse, yep. get them into that, you know, net, but not, you know, scare them to the point where they're not going to do it. And so that comes in where you you put out an ebook or a template or a a webinar or, you know, all that kind of thing where you're grabbing an email address, maybe grabbing a phone number and you're just bringing someone into your network for the building construction coach. He's a numbers whiz, accounting whiz. So we put together like a cash flow template spreadsheet for builders where they can put in everything, all their numbers from the last job and then see, okay, this was my costs. Here's my profit. And then what to do with that profit to actually keep cash flow in the business. Yeah. Builders were having issues because they're really great at what they did. They're craftsmen, they're experts. But when it comes to the business side of it, so many of them don't scale because of that. Mm-hmm. So when we find a business owner who, who clicks on our resource and they download it, we know that they, they want what we can help them with. So the first thing is we do that and we go fishing a little bit with that and, and we go gr- really grassroots. We put out uh, a sort of a lead magnet advert people can click on. We think, you know, are we getting a good cost per click? Is this, you know, costing us much money to have someone put in their email address or their phone number to download this resource? If they're flowing in nice and quickly, we know this is a good offer. We know that this is helpful. People want it. And then we'll worry about building the back end, the email retargeting, the landing pages, the funnels. What we don't do is go in and spend three months building a huge campaign spending 10 grand and three months launch it and then wait for it to, you know, f- you know, work or flop. Yep. We do it the other way around. We, we kind of agile or lean. <laughs> yeah. 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 We, we yep. test the waters first with something very simple. And my clients will literally sit down and ring the phone numbers they get. Yep. And I'm like, this is outbound. This is scary, but we're going to do it. Um, we're going to find out who these people are. Yep. If they're great. And we say, okay, this is fantastic. Let's expand upon this offer. Let's move people further down the funnel and we'll build a landing page. We'll uh, put some testimonials on there, some branding. And then once people have taken that first offer, which is low commitment, low risk for them, we might move them into something that might take them 25 minutes, like watching a training or filling in a questionnaire. And then after, you know, either on the third page of your landing page funnel or during an email sequence or whatever, We will invite people to come in for a session with you for a phone call, let them build their trust in their own time. And then eventually there's no better feeling than wake up in the morning with someone has booked into your calendar because they've absorbed your content. And that's the goal really. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the goal really. So uh, yeah, we, we start at the top of the funnel every time, no matter who you are, I need to figure out what brings your audience in. So then we can speak to that and uh, build the trust. It's really interesting. I actually did um, videos many, many years ago when I um, first started coaching, kind of held 10, 11 years ago. And it was all just around um, having people feel like they already know you when they actually meet you for the first time. Because the, it's always really scary meeting someone for the first time. Even when I have a podcast guest coming, I was like, my goodness, who am I going to meet? What are they going to be like? Will I like them? Um, and so the whole point of the video was just more to get them that. So by the time they actually got to speak to you, they felt like they already knew who you were. And I thought that was a really interesting learning because it definitely worked. People said, oh, you know, yeah, I, I, I feel like I know you already. Yeah, and that's uh, the the shift that we're getting a lot these days as well is that um, when we're talking about being authentic and showing yourself on, on camera and in your marketing, we need to speak in our own voices these days. It's a, an email that comes and looks like it's from a company covered in branding and headers and clickable things they go straight into the junk. They go straight into, oh, no, I'm getting sold to, push it over there. What most of my clients are doing, we're writing, you know, black and white, 
you know, four or five line emails from Chris, from Deborah, uh, and really just speaking in our own voice, being authentic and yeah, building that trust. So when they hop on the phone with you or one of your team, they know who you are and um, that's half the sale done. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So can you share with us some of the, the challenges that you've had and how you've overcome them for clients? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of them is when a product or a service really isn't that sexy, <laughs> you know, when, um, you know, some, it's, it's really easy to get a lot of downloads when you've got a client like my, my old client, Bianca, who was, I know she was like 42 and she was just ripped. She was just shrink wrapped, you know, incredible looking fitness nutrition coach and um, put out a photo of her download this book and you can look like me hundreds of clicks and everything like that really easy to get quantity and get people in a conversation with you because they all want that when I have clients who have something you know equally impactful but a little less clickable such as mental well-being or reducing burnout that's a longer journey and that's something where you really got to be sensitive on the front end of um, what's going to get people clicking. How do we find the right demographic? And really understanding that if you don't have such a, a hypey and in-demand service, you've kind of got just got to be a little more patient with it and notice that while a fitness coach or someone who's promising money and Lamborghinis and pools is going to get hundreds and thousands of clicks and people onto their email list and stuff like that, a very small percentage of them will be the right person to actually invest and work with you. Whereas if you're going for an offer that is admittedly going to be more niche, um, a little less broad, a little less shiny and sexy, then except that you're going to get less engagement, but the people who do engage will be more of the right client for you. And so I think the biggest challenge with a lot of my clients is that patience and making decisions logically rather than emotionally. If something isn't working the way they expect it on day dot, and often that's because they've compared it to how someone else's ads have performed. And that's why it's kind of my job to help people to realize that if we're hitting certain numbers, if we're getting leads in at a certain cost and phone numbers at this, you can still be very profitable with this business. You're not flooded in appointments. You're not flooded in clicks and likes and downloads. But when you get someone on the phone, you know, they've come through a pretty specific path to get there. And so if you're confident in your ability to, to sell, if you have fewer people come through, it's just quality over quantity. And that does happen. You do see both styles of marketers in the people who are quantity and get shit loads of downloads and leads. Their issue is often going to be digging through and finding the right people to sell to. And that's why we use funnels to kind of bring them down. Mm -hmm. And then on the flip side, people with a really impactful service, I'm working with a, um, I'm starting work with a company who work with building managers and strata managers. That's tough to make a really cool video about on Facebook. But once they get on the phone with one of them, then uh, they're probably going to be in their in their wheelhouse and someone who can they can really help. So, yeah, patience and just never compare yourself to other people and how their results have happened because we're all in our own race. Yeah, I think it's a little bit like the long term um, long tail search term on on Google as well. If people are putting in quite specific things, then yeah. you know that they're actually looking to purchase as opposed to just doing some general research about what's out there. Yeah, hundred percent. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, so I'm a little bit interested. I've got to ask this. It's got nothing to do with what we normally talk about, but you're a chef. I was a chef for a couple of years as well over in the Kidding. UK. Yeah. Um, what have you brought from your chefing days into business? Um, I think uh, a, f- a few things. That's a really interesting question, by the way, Deb. No one's actually asked me that. Yeah. But um, one is going to be, I, th- I think I'm relatively good with pressure. Yeah, because a lot of cooking as I never understood why it's such a high pressure environment because it's not life and death. It's lunch. (laughs) Um, 
it's a high pressure environment and I can, you know, I, I can deal with things going wrong. And also I, it's given me a good, um, a good backbone to not take shit from people. I yeah. think that's another thing as well is a lot of people early on in business, you really just want to please clients, but in a kitchen environment, everyone's shouting at each other and kind of what's said during service stays during service. And so if someone's called you a fucking asshole during service, because you dropped some asparagus or, you know, thrown a set of tongs at your head. And I worked in fine dining restaurants. So this has all happened to me. Yeah. Then you really learn that one, that <laughs> that doesn't matter so much if that happens, yep. it, it's just business really. And two, um, having that happen to me when I was younger, I, I won't let people talk down to me anymore, which is, uh, which is a good thing in a service-based business because some people do really get on their high horse a bit. The other thing I've probably learned is that there's a very fine balance between speed and quality. Right. Okay. And um, I've worked in places which are fine dining, seven or eight gorse degustations, preening over every plate. And then I've worked in places where you are slinging out omelets you know, every four minutes, you know, and uh, you see people um, in, in the marketing space. There's kind of two people, two kinds of people I've found There's marketers who will spend three months and then deliver you this enormous big product. And then there's people who will be like done the next day and it's a bit of a hack job. Yeah. And so I think an attention to detail, but being able to, you know, execute things quickly is, um, is a good one. And then the, same, the other thing, Dem, I think just hospitality, just, I think it makes you a better person. Yeah. I think dealing with the public, dealing with people and, you know, learning to work in a, an environment that isn't air conditioned with fluorescent lights and, wow. you know, set hour long breaks and you know, yeah, HR departments and all that kind of thing. I think that I will definitely get my daughter's work in hospitality just to whip them into shape because I think it's just a work ethic thing. I think it makes you a nothing against anyone who hasn't done it, but I just find myself to have more resilience than a lot of people I've met who um, perhaps have taken a more traditional route in life. Yeah. Okay. But, but I don't want to sound like I'm a big shot because I'm absolutely not, but um, I, I think it's a really, really great industry. Uh to get in too early and then leave early as well. <laughs> yeah, it kills you at the end. Um, and so my next question is around, you know, you've gone from being a one-man band as a coach and now sort of building up a little business yourself. Yep. What have been your biggest learnings in that part? Um, investing in training is yep. huge and annoying and frustrating and expensive and hardly ever seems worth it until it's done the job you want it to do. So I, um, I, I hire young people. I hire people in the kind of like early twenties to help them to, to learn what they're doing. You know, I work with people in the Philippines you know, I'll be transparent. I've got kind of uh, VAs and freelancers in the Philippines, yep. which is a financial decision. You know, wages here in Australia are really high. But these people are super skilled and super hardworking, but um, it, it can be really, really frustrating to, be explaining a job to someone that you could do in half the time and you explain it three or four times and it's still not perfect. And then a client uh, notices a fuck up that, you know, your assistant has made because this link isn't working properly. And one thing that's taught me is that um, I definitely need to, you know, pay even more attention when there's other people. Yeah, having a team doesn't mean you can slack off and allow them to do everything. It means you have to be across stuff even more. And everything falls on your shoulders. You've got to be that leader, take ownership of someone who, who makes the stuff up on your behalf. But also when you do reach that sweet spot, when someone can do the jobs that you've been investing time and money training to do, it opens up whole new windows for your business. So I've got um, all my social media is now managed by uh, my social media manager who we invested heaps of time in me teaching him to write better copy, to edit graphics, to source podcast guests and edit video and that's probably you know 15 hours a week gone now out of my schedule to to go and grow so 
Yeah. You, know, you can spend that time doing the stuff that you're really good at, which um, I'm assuming is probably best something better than the social media. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I've I've actually my income has dropped a little and then plateaued since I brought on a team. Yep. For, but now I see the way we're starting this year, the skills that they've both got, the potential is there to grow exponentially now. Yeah. Because I spent three months of not doing everything myself and, you know, having a bit of a tough time sometimes going over things again and again with someone who maybe told me they could do something, but they can't. Um, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> what was, was quite difficult. Uh, we took a, you know, a small income hit. But now um, I, I feel like I can take on new, new sorts of clients. I can spend my time learning new things because a lot of our business is taken care of without me even need to check in on it. And so it's been very, very rewarding. And I think financially the, um, the rewards will, will come massively this year. Without a doubt. I always sort of say to people, you know, you've got to be ready to bring people on board before you're ready for them. And then you have to be prepared to, yeah, invest in them, but uh, but also, you know, accept that they're never going to do it the way that you expect it done. So, you know, 80% is good enough. And if you can get to 80%, then just imagine that stuff is gone from your plate and suddenly life becomes a whole lot easier because you're doing the stuff that you love. That's totally right. And for yeah. me, honestly, this year, my next hire is going to be an appointment setter, someone to call my leads and to have a chat with them and book them into my calendar because I had a really successful ad campaign going a few, you know, a few months back and I just had leads sitting there because I've got two young babies and from about 4 PM every day, I'm just elbow deep in bolognese and nappies and baths. And that goes to about 7 PM. And that's a really sweet spot to catch people for a quick phone call. And I was spending money and wasting it on leads. So Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it allows me to go and grow my business, but it also allows me to, you know, design the lifestyle I want, which yeah. right now is um, how can I invest a lot of time in watching my daughters grow up? Hey, look, we're, we're running short of time. It's uh, so easy to just chat all, all afternoon, all sorry, day. Sorry, sorry. I talk no, a lot. Not at all. Then. That's cool. I'm enjoying it. Absolutely enjoying it. But I want to make sure that we actually leave with some tips for the listeners. Sure. So can you just give us three top tips. They could be um, things that you have helped people with. It could be books, tools, whatever it might be. Just tell me what your, your three top tips are. Get your message and your offer into one sentence. Yep. And if you need a very generic way of doing that, it is I help in parentheses, people yep. to achieve, in parentheses, desire without, in parentheses, pain. So who do you help? How do you help them get there? And then what's an objection they often give you, such as in the weight loss space, I help new mums lose the baby belly, even if they're getting no sleep every night, or even if they can't get themselves to the gym. That even if is one that's really, really important for people. Uh, yeah, I love it. Cool. Um, Two would be uh, launch things quickly and then invest the time in testing rather than building. So if you're in a paid ad or even an organic space, um, the faster you get your ads or message out there, the quicker you learn. The more money you spend on your budget, the faster you'll learn what does work and what doesn't. So most of my job is not actually writing copy. It's testing ads, seeing what is effective, turning audiences on and off. But I can't do that until we've actually put something out there. So stop being perfect. Make it, as, make it look great. But um, like we said before, if you spend two months to launch something and then you launch it, uh, you're actually you know seven weeks behind the learnings you could have got if you launched that thing in the first week. So launch quickly and spend your time testing. <laughs> and third... Um, I think that risk thing is really, really big. Think about, think, you know, put yourself in your audience's shoes when you're putting out an offer and think about, you know, how much are you really asking from people to download this thing or to click onto this offer? Because if you're going for people who are corporate and busy, don't give them something that's going to take away their time. Give them something that's going to give them more time back. Uh, Really think about, how much you're asking of people. And if you think you're asking too much, um, 
pull it back, put another step at the top of your funnel there, which is going to be a really cool, easy way uh, of, of just getting people into your network. Because once they're in, then they can see the value. Then all the content you're posting becomes relevant. Um, but just don't dive to the bottom of that funnel and assume people are ready to buy. And don't assume people care who you are yet. Uh, just you know, get them in the network and give them your best over and over again because they'll come back. Love it. Absolutely perfect. Hey, um, one of the things that I always say to my clients is that, you know, you should be doing the stuff that you really love and you're really great at. Uh, the rest of the stuff you should be delegating and elevating yourself up to that unique God-given that, um, ability. So on that basis, I would say, you know, for most of my clients, don't do this stuff yourself. Go and find somebody like Alex who can actually help you with it uh, because that's going to take away all the pain. So if they want to talk to you, I, mean, I know you've got two lots of programs. One is done for you where you'll literally do the whole thing. Um, obviously, they have to have some input into it, but you will actually sort the whole program out and the other part is more coaching and consulting for those who want to do it themselves is that right yeah and that really depends on you know where you're at what skills you have yep. uh what's your budget i do have people you know with higher budgets who still just want to do consulting because they love implementing things themselves yep. and i do have some people who you know maybe time is a massive issue for them so they're happy to go backwards a bit financially to then get that leverage out of the way so yep. that's the kind of thing we'd figure out during a discussion and um yeah just seeing where you're at in your business brilliant so how do they get in contact with you alex to the moon digital is what we're at on uh, facebook and instagram alexander morris uh on on linkedin and i've got a podcast i'd love to get you on at some point as well deb called coaches sure. to the moon yep. um coaches to the moon podcast is uh we're about 40 episodes in right now i'm quite proud of it and uh that's that's a that's a cool listen as well. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to just plug people to come work with me. I'd love people to listen to that one, and we're very similar, you know, kind of a question and answer format. Let's yep. give some value. So that's on Spotify, it's on Apple, it's on Anchor, it's on YouTube. I'm trying to be o- o- omnipresent everywhere Makes under sense. that guise of To the Moon Digital. Okay, so To the Moon Digital on your Facebook, Instagram, Alexander Morris on LinkedIn, and then we've got Coaches of the Moon Podcast. Brilliant. That's hey, awesome. look. Loved, loved chatting to you. I'm sure we'll talk a whole lot more. Uh, really appreciate your time. Uh, thank you for coming and joining us. I absolutely can't wait to talk to you some more, Deb. It's been a real pleasure. And uh, yeah, send some love to that elephant and to the whole country of New Zealand for me. We will do. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alex. Have a good one. Bye. Thanks again for joining us on Better Business, Better Life with me, your host, Deborah Chantry Taylor. If you enjoyed what you heard, then please subscribe to this podcast and let us help you to get what you want out of business and life. Each week we release a new short episode which will give a success story and three takeouts to put into action immediately. These will help you take your business from good to great. The podcast is also supported by free resources, templates and useful tools which you can find at deborahchantrytaylor.com. I am a trained entrepreneurial leadership and business coach, a professional EOS implementer and an established business owner myself. I work with established businesses to help them get what they want. Feel free to contact me if you'd like to have a chat about how I might be able to help you or if you'd like to join me as a guest on this podcast. Thanks again to NZ Audio Editors for producing this podcast. See you on the next episode.